Namaskar Nileshok with another session. In this session, we will look at a question coming from one of the Mahabharat enthusiasts. And he asking a question. Now the title I have given for this episode is Are Mahabharat Researchers Intellectually Bankrupt? And or do they lack integrity? To err is human and all of us make mistakes, errors. And also as a human tendency, when someone tries to correct us, we may or may not accept it because of the emotion attached to our own position. That is that raga dvesha moha, the raga part, the emotion part. However, a genuine researcher, a genuine individual, after hearing a feedback multiple times, may want to actually go to the bottom of the subject and check for oneself if he or she is wrong. What I am seeing for the last 30 plus years, and especially last 12 to 15 years since I published my first book, because that's when I started interacting very actively with many Indic researchers. And just for the record, for the most part, I'm referring to the so-called pro-Indic researchers. And this is a problem. Today, in today's episode, this the context is somebody with the initials SJ writing to me. So that's his uh, part of his email. Nilesh, not only Nityananda Mishraji, but even likes of Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji or late Professor Narari Acharji are claiming Kartika Masa, that's the lunar month of Kartika, coinciding with the end of Sharad season at the time of Mahabharat war. <clears throat> so what this SJ is referring to when he's referring to the so-called claim of Nityananda Mishraji, if you want to understand what he was claiming, I think it was in a foreword that he, he wrote to another book. And uh, I mean, it's a classic foreword. Everyone should read the foreword. And if you want to read the book, yeah, that's fine too. It's what a royal disaster it is, but don't take my word, okay? As if he chose the most potent weapon that he thought, he meaning Nityananda Mishraji, against me. What is interesting is that in many other places where he has tried to do the so-called critic of my work, and in multiple places he has claimed that he is confident that I will not respond, but if I respond, he will be happy. Interestingly, when I did respond, and that was because I think it was Girish Naikji who asked me a specific question, quoting uh, false claims of Nityananda Mishraji, and therefore I responded. That video can be seen on my channel, Dood Ka Dood or Pani Ka Pani, Hatred and Idiocy Driven Interpretation of Mahabharat Shanti Parva verse Adhyay 171, Shlok 18, and you can see that. Now there, this Nityananda Mishraji was claiming that Mahabharata text has a reference <clears throat> stating that at the time of Mahabharata war, lunar month of Kartik used to occur at the end of Sharat season. And I'll not go into the details because what a disaster that claim is or was and I have given a appropriate response in this video. But now what SJ is saying, this is not a new thing to me anyways, but uh, I'm so glad that people are waking up 
likes of SJ. And so he said, hey, look, what Nityananda Mishra is showing now, of course, uh, you know, that was a, a disaster for a different reason. But in this case, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar G and Professor Narari Acharji, who is no longer with us, he passed away a few years ago. They both have claimed, are claiming lunar month of Kartik, also coinciding with the end of Sharad season at the end of Mahabharat war. Okay. And he's saying, AJ is saying that he has seen my impressive rebuttal to Nityananda Mishraji. So it appears he is convinced about it. And he's asking me if I have responded to either Dr. Bhatnagar or Professor Achar and their claims. All right. What is that Mahabharat reference? It occurs in Udyog Parva, Adhyay 81, Shlok 7. Komude Masi Revatyam, Sharadante Himagame, Spita Sasya Sukhe Kale, Kalya Sattva Vatam Varha. Of course, this is astronomy reference because there is a specific reference to seasons. Sharadante at the end of Sharad season and Himagame at the beginning of Hemant Rutu and at the time or during the time of the month of lotuses, Komude. Now, those people who enthusiastically, excitedly look at this reference as their life savior, as it relates to the, their claim for the dating of Mahabharat war, have made a disaster out of it. But frankly, the reference is such that it is, if somebody takes this literally and seriously, it is a royal disaster for anyone, exceptions none, anyone claiming the year of Mahabharat war that would range from say 7,000 BCE to 1,000 BCE. That includes 99.99% of all the Mahabharata dating claims. Now, just to keep this session of a reasonable time interval, we will only focus on one aspect of it, but briefly I will mention a few other aspects. Let's look at month of Kaumudi. <clears throat> Majority of Mahabharata researchers, especially those who refer to this verse, this shlok, they are adamant that the month of Komodi means month of Kartika. How illogical, how nonsensical. Now, what is the nonsensical part? Can the month of Komodi be month of Kartika? Yes, of course it can be. So the illogical and nonsensical part is if somebody insists that the month of Komodi can only mean month of Kartika and no other month. This is illogical, this is idiotic, this is stupid, this is wrong, this is faulty. Based on what? Well, Kaumude Masi. They could have said Kartika. But how did somebody figure out Kaumude means Kartika? Ah, dictionaries. Now, these people, and this includes majority of Mahabharata researchers, they see the reference in the dictionary referring to month of Kaumude as referring to month of Kartik. They conveniently ignore the other reference given as month of Ashwin. Now, from my experience, I'll tell you, me growing up in the Western part of India, the month of Shravan, and this is not that long ago, the month of Shravan was actually the month of lotuses. I remember just after the heavy rains starts subsiding, we would go during the month of Shravan around Rakshabandhan, to the ponds and the lakes in that area and these would be filled with uh, lotuses of different colors and we would harvest them anyways so as far as i'm concerned the month of komodi is month of shravan and the dictionary will say month of ashwin Ash month of kartik and keep in mind desha kala patra if you apply these three criteria depending on which part of the world northern hemisphere southern hemisphere it would be different month which would coincide or can be considered month of Komodi. But that's not the main subject today. But this is enough for those who very lazily, carelessly and casually insist that month of Komodi means month of Kartik. Okay, I'll show a quick evidence of that. Sharadante is also been confused. 
Sharad Ante means the end of Sharad. But some people have taken this as during Sharad. Now, I don't want to get into this debate for a simple reason. It does not matter whether somebody takes during Sharad or at the end of Sharad. Basically, still this reference is a disaster, a poison, a poison pill for anyone claiming the year of Mahabharat war anytime from 7000 BC to 1000 BC. Let's go further. These next two is what we are going to focus in this episode. When did the lunar month of Kartik occur in Sharat season? And when did the lunar month of Kartik occur at the end of Sharat season? Because that's what this reference is saying. Assuming somebody takes Kaumude as a Kartik. So for the next discussion, because there are multiple blunders made by these researchers, we will only focus on this one blunder, which is the way they calculated the timing for the lunar month of Kartik aligning with the timing of Sharad season. Okay, so these two second last bullet and one before that, these two bullets. In fact, there is every reason, and that's not the subject today, how to identify Patabed, how to identify possibly interpolated references, how to do research to identify interpolated references, how to explain it to people and so on. We will do this some other time, but not for today. That's that last bullet. We will focus on these two bullets, namely the lunar month of Kartik and the Sharad season. All right. At the end of the day, as I said, this reference is a disaster for any Mahabharata researcher who want to take it seriously, literally, and claim, pretend, try to use this reference to justify their claim, they will result in a disaster. Any time between 7000 BC to 1000 BC, we'll see why that is so. So essentially, the, by insisting on use, use of this reference, I mean, this should be included, they are entering a fallacy of irrelevant reasons. Another name for that is non sequitur, which is to say, yes, part of what you might be saying is correct, but the conclusion you are drawing is not correct, okay? And essentially a red herring fallacy, why is that? Because there are more crucial descriptions, such as Arundhati Vasishta, or evidence related to Bhishma Nirvana, evidence related to planetary descriptions, evidence related to the sun's positions, the moon's positions, moon's phases, evidence related to the Indian lunisolar calendar, lunar months, tithis, nakshatra. These people want to ignore all of that and focus on something that is a disaster for them, but they are so incompetent, they don't even understand this. And we'll see how much fun this is. Okay, let's go further. Let's begin with the claim by uh, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar. Uh, now, SJ says, I don't know, he, he did not give a specific place where he read it. To the best of my knowledge, the reference I found for what he was asking is in this paper published by Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar. Uh, sometime in 2017, date of Mahabharat war, based on astronomical references, a reassessment. I would encourage all of you to read this paper in the original for all the fun. We will focus on his claim uh, where he states that the lunar month of Kartik aligned with the Sharath season only during 2250 BC through 1280 BC. How does he reach this conclusion? Well, it's very interesting, funny, disastrous, faulty, and wrong. He says, if we want to look at the full moon of Kartik, so Kartik full moon, and if that needs to align at the time of the Sharad season, the sun's position would be 180 degree opposite, and therefore it will fall somewhere the sun's position between Anuradha and Vishaka. Now, in that statement, he is correct. He also says, again, he gives that same explanation. He says, the autumn season implies that the sun was located in or close to autumnal equinox. Yes, in fact, for autumn season, and that's a wrong translation, we should stick to Sharad. 
I'll tell you the problem with that autumn translation or winter translation in a minute. But otherwise it's correct that the Sharath season essentially would mean the sun's position is at autumnal equinox or plus minus 30 degree. That is basically definition. Unfortunately, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar is not aware of this 30 degree or if he is aware, he has actually not taken that into account, insisted on something very faulty and created a disaster for himself and anyone who reads his work and blindly, dogmatically, in an authority fallacy fashion, accepts it. Let's go further. He says, this fixes the position of autumnal equinox between Vishakha and Anuradha. Yeah, we can live with that. Now the problem begins. So, well, he says then, which occurred on 22nd September 1768 BCE. I don't know why he takes a specific day or specific year, but uh, let's live with that. What we do know is, I mean, it's a well-known thing. It's an astronomy 101, okay? That the spring equinox coincided with Nakshatra Kritika around 2200 BCE, which also means the exactly opposite of that will be the position of the sun. And when the position of the moon is near Kritika, that would be the middle of Sharat season. So that would be 2200 BC for reason that I do not understand. Ashok Bhatnagarji says 1768 BC. Well, it's approximate region. It's not like one specific year. But anyways, okay. But the fun is not over, guys. It's just beginning. Then he says, uh, the autumnal equinox would remain in one nakshatra for about 960 years. We can agree with that. Now the disaster. He says this limits the period of our search roughly from the year 20 to 50 BC, that negative signs referring to the BC, to 1280 BC. This is, uh, this is basically a non sequitur fallacy. Whatever he said before can be considered as reasonable and some of it is accurate. But from that, he reaching this conclusion, therefore, the, the lunar month of Kartik would occur in Sharad season between 2250 BC and 1280 BC. And only between this time period is wrong. It's faulty. It's disasters. It's a disaster. Sorry. And look what he's saying. And I'm glad he says this because that's wrong, but I'm not putting words in his mouth. He says, beyond this, these limits, Kartik month of sidereal lunisolar Indian calendar begins to lose its connection with autumn season and the corresponding tropical calendar dates. What he's saying there, let me see if I highlighted that. I did highlight this. This is wrong, faulty. I don't know, incorrect, whatever is the right word to use, okay? So what's the fallacy? First thing, this is wrong. Not everything, but the time period that he has arrived at, and this is all about time period. You'll see how much uh, fighting is going on in the peer-reviewed world, okay? All right. So this fallacy is a non-sequitur fallacy, which is to say, well, you might have said something correct, but the way you are drawing conclusion is not correct, and we are going to see why that is so. His paper itself is a classic example of cherry picking fallacy, but that's not the subject today. So I will move on only by stating that is so. I would encourage all of you to read his paper and actually find out why it is a cherry picking fallacy and many instances of this fallacy of non sequitur. Okay. All right. So what do we have? Okay, next. On the left, what you're seeing is uh, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji's translation from his paper. If I read the translation, it tells me that essentially he has borrowed it from uh, Professor Achar. Okay, but Professor Achar's own translation or translation of Ashok Bhatnagarji, I mean, I'm not 100% sure. I have seen both of them quoting the same translation. Some problems with it. For example, the Sharadante Himagame is translated, this Sharadante Himagame is translated, translated as autumn to winter. That is not correct. It creates more problems. And actually, these researchers can hide under this vague translation, wrong translation. 
Why it is so? Because in the Indian astronomy, when you are referring to Sharad season and Hemanta season and Shishir season and Vasanta season and Grishma season and Varsha season, we are dividing the whole year, 12 months, solar months into six seasons. So each season is of two months. That is not the case when you look at the West and how they divide the seasons, okay? For example, when they are using the word autumn or fall and winter, they are dividing the year into typically four seasons. So winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Therefore, we have to be careful uh, when we translate for, uh, that Hemanta as winter and Sharad as autumn, okay? But let's move on. In fact, then there is some other ways, like instead of saying Hemant at the bottom in the translation, it says dewy season. I don't understand why, but let's move on. Just quick uh, indication here, what I referred to before, the Kaumudi really simply means, because Kaumudi Mase is a lunar month of lotuses, but just Kaumudi by itself, you cannot translate it as a Kartik. In fact, because of its association possibly in some place at some particular time with the month of Ashwin or Kartik, it is said this Kaumudi means the month of Ashwin, month of Kartik and so on. But really what it means is it's related to the lotuses, related to water lilies and because the water lily is comparison with the moonshine or full moon, therefore you see the word is used uh, synonymously referring to moonshine, moonlight and so on. Okay, so very important to remember this. Okay, when did the lunar month of Kartik occur during the Sharad season? Well, as I said, uh, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji writes that between 2250 BC and 1280 BC. And what logic does he use? He says he finds the position of the sun opposite, 180 degree opposite to Kartik. Please pay attention. Okay, and he says the sun's position would be between Anuradha and Vishakha. And for one nakshatra space, autumnal equinox will uh, moment will take about 960 years. And so he takes that thousand year approximately and arrives at that, that number. It's bizarre as far as I'm concerned how he is coming up with that number. There is no basis. There is no astronomy basis for doing something like this. Especially when he says that if somebody goes beyond these boundaries, the connection between lunar month of Kartik and Sharad season is lost. That is simply not true. Okay. All right. Now, interesting. So Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji published the paper and uh, this is 2017 and uh, Professor Narari HR, late Professor Narari HR, he's no longer with us. He decided to respond, which is great. You know, that's how vade vade jayate tattva bodho. Unfortunately, this is a good example where vade vade may not lead to tattva bodha. But at least now with this particular episode, we will able to claim that yes, it if done properly, it does lead to tattva bodha. Okay, tattva jnan, you know, knowledge, uh, understanding of the first principle, understanding of the causality, understanding of the truth, knowledge of the truth, tattva bodh, comprehension of the truth, tattva jnan, knowledge of like shashti tatpurush, you can use the word tattva bodh or tattva jnan in that sense. So uh, Professor Narari HR responded, objecting and critiquing the claim of uh, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar. So what is Professor Achar saying? He says the lunar month of Kartik aligns with Sharad season only during 3200 BC through 1800 BC. So yes, there is an overlap about four, four months, 400 years. But let's look at um, Professor Achar's argument. Now he's critiquing Ashok Bhatnagarji's claims and he says a moment's reflection, I'm just taking a portion of his paper here, a moment's reflection will bring out the fallacy of this argument. By this argument, he means the argument of um, uh, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji. Now, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji's argument is fallacious, is correct. However, what Professor Achar is proposing is equally bizarre. He says, the point is that on Kartik Purnima, the moon may be located anywhere from Bharani to Rohini and not just in Kritika. 
In this statement, Professor Achar is correct. Then he says, this is true for any of the 12 full moons that there is a three nakshatra interval to be considered. Again, Professor Achar is correct so far. Now the bizarre part begins. Based on this information, so there is a uh, area of two nakshatras. And why does he say two nakshatra? Because the full moon of Kritika, in principle, would vary between Bharani and Roini. That's correct. But from that information, he is drawing a faulty, incorrect, foolish inference. And what is this inference? He says, this means that the connection, I have highlighted this, this means that the connection of Kartika month with autumn season extends roughly from about 1800 BCE to 3200 BCE. It is faulty, it is wrong, it is incorrect. And we are going to see how that is so. He says this, and I'm glad again what he's writing after this. He says this also means that the war could not have taken place much earlier than 3200 BCE or much later than about 1800 BCE. Well, if your premise is wrong, then the inference you draw is wrong. Okay, so that's a, that's a fallacy. That's not a logical fallacy. That's just a faulty statement. Anyways, let's move on. But there is also a logical fallacy, the non sequitur fallacy, that from the fact Barni to Rohini is the range where the full moon of Kritika can be, and that's correct. He drawing that reference of 1800 BC to 3200 BCE is false, wrong, incorrect. Okay, anyone with the astronomy 101, the basic knowledge of astronomy should, would be able to tell this. In fact, it can be a good test of any individual how much astronomy he or she knows. Okay, let's move on. So this is wrong. The conclusion is wrong. Again, this is a non sequitur fallacy. And if you want to read uh, Professor Achar's response or in general his work, I mean, it's a fallacy festival, fallacies festival, guys. Okay, sometime we, if we get time, we will, we will refer to this, but let's move on. Now, after Professor Narari Achar responded critic through this same journal, the claim of Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji, Ashok Bhatnagarji provided the rejoinder. Again, uh, to, to Professor Achar. Now, two parts, okay? So, this was a great opportunity for Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar to kind of pause and see if he was wrong. Assuming the knowledge of astronomy that he's claiming, I'm going to read that in a minute. Assuming that is correct, all it would have taken him is possibly 20 minutes to realize his mistake and correct it. Instead, he jumped into a authority fallacy of his own. He, he went on to write, as to the opening remarks by Professor Narari Achar about my background, my meaning um, Dr. Bhatnagarji's background, in meteor meteorology, not metrology as mentioned by him, him meaning Achar, so mistake there. I wish to submit, that is, uh, Bhatnagarji likes to submit, that he has been trained and worked as a professional astronomer, I think I might have highlighted, let me see, yes, I have been trained and worked as a professional astronomer for 28 years before taking up higher responsibilities in IMD. Okay. It would be relevant to mention here that the responsibility for providing scientific inputs for implementing calendar reform in India and framing a uniform Indian calendar lies with IMD since 1957. For this purpose, IMD maintains an office called Positional Astronomy Center. Wow, great. Where I work, where Bhatnagarji worked for 19 years. On paper, at least, extremely impressive experience. Unfortunately, the experience has not resulted into correct answers. Instead of taking this opportunity, I mean, yes, Professor Narari Achar himself is wrong, but the fact that he raised the question, maybe before jumping and just insisting that his original claim is still correct, Professor Bhatnagar just went on writing some stuff which has no relevance to what is being asked. 
or what is being objected to. And essentially he's saying, look, what I said is correct, okay? That the lunar month of Kartik and the connection with Sharad season is during this thousand year period, 2250 BC to 1280 BCE. And then he, in his justification, he talks about the precession and on and on, okay? That's what, of course wrong. And we are going to see how. Again, as I already mentioned, the fallacy here is authority fallacy. The thing is, what he says about his work is true. But at the end of the day, it should reflect into demonstration of it. Proof is in the pudding. And that is not seen. In fact, very adamantly, dogmatically it appears, he sticks with his faulty claim. Okay, we'll see how that is faulty, why it is faulty. All right. So let's take, let's look at Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji's claim. He says, based on one nakshatra interval, which is what is wrong, of course. Okay, and we'll see why. If you plot this, a, a horizontal time axis from say 5,000 BC to 1,000 BC, this is where the claim of Dr. Bhatnagarji falls. He's saying this is that shown by that blue arrow, double arrow, is the region where lunar month of Kartik would occur during the Sharad season. And once you go beyond that, that won't be the case. What does or what did Professor and Dr. Narari HR said? He said, but Nagarji's claim is incorrect and he has a correct claim. That's what he thought. And he says from 3200 BC to 1800 BC, uh, that's wrong. But not only the answer is wrong, even the logic and rational that he uses itself is wrong. He says the position of full moon of uh, Kartik would range between Bharani and Rohini. So Bharani, Kritika, Rohini. So these two nakshatra space. And based on that, he calculated 1400 years. So now I don't understand how he calculated 1400 years. First thing, the basis the variation of the full moon of Krutika, of Kartik, using that and therefore counting two nakshatras is wrong. But after counting two nakshatra, why did he not go for 2000 years? And why did he uh, limited himself to 1400 years is a mystery and that we will never know. Interestingly, he has many uh, followers who blindly and carelessly and casually repeat his claim of 3067 BCE for the year of Mahavarat war, which is not original claim of Professor Achar. In fact, it is another careless, casual claim made by late Professor Case Raghavan in 1969. If time permits, another time we will discuss that. But let's focus on lunar month of Kartik occurring during the Sharad season and the uh, time-bound interval for this to happen. So if we plot the claim of Professor Narari HR, it will fall something like this. As I said, there is an overlap period. Just keep that in mind. So I would say approximately say 2200 BC, because that's exactly was the peak when lunar month of Kartik would have coincided with the Sharad season. But that's the center point with the autumnal equinox. In reality, lunar month of Kartik would have coincided with the Sharad season for a much longer time interval than claimed by both of these researchers. Okay, let's go further. Now, uh, SJ asked me if I gave a rebuttal. Now, I knew Professor Narari uh, We had... Uh, email communication, sometimes phone conversations. And of course, we used to meet at many conferences. Going on uh, the conferences, the first conference I met him was, I think, in 2016. But the email correspondence with him is going was going on. Now, he's no longer uh, with us. But was going on, I like to think, at least, say, from sometime 2007 and afterwards. I'm just... Uh, you know, uh, thinking from my memory, so the, the year may not be exact, but sometime after 2007, let's say, until um, his sad passing away. So I did bring, when I read that paper, I did bring it to his attention. And guess what? 
he insisted on him being correct. All my attempts to show him why he is wrong basically fell on <laughs> silent ears, you know, and he kept on writing such as this one example at Pragita and I did respond to him and then he responded and I responded and then he stopped. So I stopped. I mean, it was pure waste of time, I think, in some ways on my point. Essentially, he's repeating that same argument, if you notice. Okay, so Bharani to Rohini. And therefore, now he's saying 180 degree opposite would be Vishaka to Jeshta. And there is nothing to disagree here. Bharani to Rohini as a place, as a range where the Kartika full moon would fall. Nothing wrong with that. That's correct information. And the Kartik Purnima, the sun would be somewhere between Vishaka to Jeshta is also correct. Again, this is a non sequitur fallacy example. But from that, to conclude, therefore, that this alignment would occur between 1800 BC and 3200 BCE is decisively false. And he says, I thank God he says that. He says it can happen only between 1800 BC and 3200 BC, no date much earlier than 3200 BC. And thank God he mentions. 5561 BC. See, that's the beauty of 5561 BC. Whether you like it or not, you better mention it. If you don't mention it, the evidence for 5561 BC is so ironclad that somebody is going to ask you, why did you not do the Puru Paksha of 5561 BC? So when somebody mentions it, a common man thinks, oh, this guy must have done a Puru Paksha. Okay. Now, if you don't mention it, that's what will happen. If you mention it, then of course the question should be asked, why did you not do a Puro Paksha and why did you not take into account all the evidence from the Mahabharata text that was taken into account in arriving at 5561 BC? But let's move on. We will stick to lunar month of Kartik and Sharat season or end of Sharat season. Now, notice this Udyog Parva reference 81.7 refers to that Sharadante Himagame. So Kaumude, if somebody translates as most of the Mahabharata researchers do as Kartik. So Kartik occurring at the end of Sharad Rutu, which is another reference from Mahabharata text, nothing to do with the Mahabharata war. And Nityananda Mishraji carelessly and casually okay, uh, took it as like a great aha moment okay, to show how I am wrong and why did I not include it. And I have shown what a disaster it is for him. And uh, I would encourage people to watch that talk, Dut ka Dut, Pani ka Pani. But again, this is a deja vu, of course, based on a different reference. Okay, all right. So he says the connection, I mean, Achar says, connection between Kartik Purnima and the end of Sharad Rutu will be lost. Again, he is wrong. And I'm going to prove it. Okay. As I said, I have not contacted uh, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji. I don't know how to. And my experience of last 15 years working or trying to connect with many researchers, Indic researchers, pro-Indic researchers, is basically not very impressive. Okay. it end up I end up wasting a lot of time. And when caught, when I show them their mistakes, uh, hardly anyone, I mean, I have to really think of a name, at least a famous name, hardly anyone has ever accepted anything. So I think it's a lot easy to just show what is wrong. Again, the idea here is not to show how I am better than them or anything. But if we want to truly establish our itihasa in a adhyatmic and scientific fashion, in the Indian context, Adhyatma and Vidyan go hand in hand. Adhyatma is a refined Vidyan. Vidyan is a refined Adhyatma. If we have to do this, we have to identify our errors. We have to do Purva Paksha and we have to put forward correct information and always be willing to accept our faults, accept our errors. So when I contacted uh, Professor Achar, uh, he went into a silence and I'm just showing that somebody going into the silence, okay, is basically a nigrahastan, okay, is an occasion for rebuke which arises when the opponent makes no reply to a proposition, although it has been repeated three times. 
And I just don't mean some statement, but actually showing with the evidence why that is wrong. Uh, I'm going to show that evidence here, which I had shared with Professor Achar, and he just chose not to, he just chose not to respond. Okay, that's considered a, that person accepting the defeat. Now, he or she wouldn't say with uh, words, they don't have to. That is the wisdom of Nyaya Darshan. But there are, just next to that, there are uh, two other ways of nigrastana, the points of defeat. One is a non-ingenuity, okay, consists in one's inability to hit upon a reply. <clears throat> okay. It can be seen in many different ways. Again, it is true in case of Professor Achar, but it is also true in case of uh, Nityananda Mishraji. When I responded, of course, in responding to question of Girish Naikji, and I'll show you when somebody took my uh, YouTube response and sent it to Nityananda Mishraji, he responded, and remember what he had said before, that he would he knows, he feels confidence I won't respond. And however, he would love, he would be happy if I respond. When actually I did respond and showed what a disastrous claim that was and how he was wrong, guess what? <laughs> he responded to this in-between person who made him aware of my YouTube saying, I don't need to see that video. Okay, but let's move on. So non-ingenuity is when somebody doesn't have a good response, that's what the person may do. Something else, and that uh, Professor Achar has done it uh, as it relates to this subject, but many others, is the evasion, okay? Karya vyasanga katha vichedo vikshepaha. Evasion arises if one stops an argument in the pretext of going away to attend another business. Uh, Dr. Dieter Koch has done this with me. When we were discussing uh, the Mahabharata dating, he, he borrowing claim of Professor Daptari, 1197 BCE, and arguing with me against 5561 BCE. Okay, anyway, just mentioning a few things. That's why everyone should take to the study of Nyaya Darshana. But let's move on. Okay, how do we do Khandan? Now, you know, it's one thing, uh, if you see some of the live debates in general, I don't know, there are many live debates. And if there is one on Mahabharata dating, usually I am there, part of it. Others simply run away. A couple of them did show some courage, but they don't, at least uh, the second one, what is that? Dr. Manish Pandit never dares to share those debates with uh, on his social media. Anyway, he has not done it in the last three plus years. But his chamchas will keep on saying how he won the debate. <laughs> well, if he won the debate, he himself, but his chamchas should also share it, right? I have shared it multiple times. Okay. Anyways, back to this. So, so I'm saying these two claims are wrong. Claim of Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji, but also Professor Narari Achar. So these are those claims. Now, how can I show that these are problematics? Well, one thing is I can show that, uh, you know, just like they are using some argument, tarka, I can use tarka. But you know what? That is never satisfying to the listener. I can, of course, mention logical fallacies. That's very important, okay? Because it's a fallacious reasoning, which I have done. But in the end, it's also important that we use the tattva jnana or tattva bodh, the causality, the first principle, the foundations, the fundamentals of the subject itself to show why it is wrong and what is correct. Okay, so that's that. That's why I'm saying a false claim arrived at via speculative and careless thoughts, which is what Doctor Bhatnagar and Professor Achar have done. But can it cannot be answered meaningfully via tarka? Okay, but it must be answered by a fundamentals of the subject and tattva jnana or tattva both, causality, convention, empirical counterproof. And that's exactly what we will do through experimental observations, through simulations, analyzing existing evidence and the logical analysis and to assert that their claims are problematic. Okay, so that's what we will do. Okay, astronomy 101. Okay, I'm showing you the positions of nakshatra with respect to cardinal points in the year 5561 BC. But this is just to make one particular point that any given season, Dr. Ashok Bhatnagarji claims that it's one nakshatra space. Wrong. Actually, it's going to be about five plus nakshatra space. So if you look at this, 
the position of a sun during the Sharad season would be from where? From it will sun would travel through Mula Nakshatra, then Purvashala, then Uttarashala, then Shravan, and even Dhanishta. So about five, five more than five nakshatras, and sun would be still in the Sharad season, or that would define the Sharad season. Not one nakshatra, as claimed by Dr. Bhatnagar, not two nakshatra space, as erroneously claimed by late Professor Achar. And this is not true for Sharad season, this is true for any season. All right. So everywhere you are going to find about five nakshatras. Okay. So we will look at the calculation of that. So think of the peak of the uh, autumnal equinox. I mean, peak of the Sharad season is autumnal equinox. And that's right in the middle. But if you want to see the boundaries, the boundaries are here. Okay. So 30 degrees before autumnal equinox and 30 degrees after autumnal equinox. So total space for the sun's travel of about 60 degrees, okay? That's what the any season would be, but specifically in this case, Sharad season, all right? So what are the correct steps to identify the actual time interval when the lunar month of Kartik would align with the Sharad season? These are the steps. First, what we need to do is align the Kritika nakshatra with the point of spring equinox, which is exactly opposite, 180 degree opposite of the autumnal equinox, because that would be the position of the sun and the full moon position near Kritika then would be around at spring equinox. That is the middle of the Sharad season. This aligns sun's position at 180 degree opposite. It's very easy calculation. You, somebody can do it manually. You can do it mathematically. You can do it using astronomy simulation. Approximately, that would come to 2200 BCE. In the recent times, everybody knows that's the recent time interval, 2200 BCE, when the spring equinox coincided with Kritika nakshatra, which means the peak of Sharad season occurred around the lunar month of Kartik. That's around 2200 BC. Now, do both Professor Achar and Dr. Bhatnagar include this time? Yes, they do. But after that, it's a downhill disaster. Okay, With the false and very dogmatic and wrong claims they make to exclude other dates. As such, as I said, this claim, this reference itself is problematic. Both of these researchers do not understand the problematic nature of this reference, but we'll come to that in a minute. So what do we need to do? After this, the Sharad season, we understand last when the position of the sun is at autumnal equinox plus minus 30 degrees. From the precession, we know that the sun position shifts with respect to cardinal point by one degree every 72 years, which means what? The alignment period of lunar month of Kartik with respect to Sharad season would last from where? 2200 BC plus minus 30 times 72. So that approximately will give us 4360 BC to 40 BCE. Okay, something more. I'm not going, in, going to go into the technical details because that requires some level of maturity. Even the astronomy 101 may not be sufficient. But when you include the Adhika Masa calculation, the synchronization of lunisolar calendar, actually it extends this alignment period, specifically in this case, lunar month of Kartik with the Sharad season by another thousand plus years. Okay, that's just approximate number anyways. So I'm saying total of about 5,000 plus years. And I'm going to show you a quick demonstration of that for the time period of 4,800 BC through 300 CE guys. Okay, 17, only, only, only 1,700 years ago. And of course, going back to 7,000 years, like 5,000 BC. Okay, let's look at that. So Kartik at Midsharad, we already did this, okay, about 2200 BCE. I'm just giving you one demonstration of it. So notice, as uh, Professor Achar mentioned, the full moon uh, of Kartika has to be between, say, Bharani. This is a full moon position, you can say, or end of full moon position between Bharani and Rohini, Kritika in between. And notice the timestamp. It's the exactly same timestamp when I'm going to show you the position of sun. 
Okay, the position of sun is October 10, October 10. You can uh, pause the video and note down the timing. It's identical. And note down the right ascension of, uh, of the sun. And what does that tell you? It tells you that it is right at almost close to 12 o'clock, which is the point of autumnal equinox. 1200 right ascension is autumnal equinox. 00 is what? 00 is spring equinox and you're going to see that okay so if you look at say 2219 like 2200 notice the full moon is again between Barani and Rohini so that's the Krittika full moon and notice the right ascension for uh, the Krittika here that is 000 okay so Krittika is at spring equinox sun on the full moon day of Krittika sun is exactly opposite okay at the fall equinox you can note down the right ascension. So 1206, which means what? Approximately six degrees away from fall equinox. So you're going to get many such instances, Kartik full moon aligning with the peak of Sharad season. Now, the ringer. What about Kartika at the beginning of a Sharad season? Just to keep the video shorter, I am going to take one evidence at the each extreme. So look at 28 September 4801 BCE. Notice the full moon position of Kartik or full moon position near Kritika. It is between Rohini and Barani as claimed, correctly claimed by Professor Achar. Everything else is wrong, of course, what he's saying. And exactly same time, same day, look at the opposite position of the sun. And look at the right ascension. What does that tell you? That the position of the sun, this 10, 11, because 12, right ascension of 12 means fall equinox. So 10, 11, within the two hours, plus minus two hours, 12 plus minus two is from 10 to 14. So the sun's position is at 10, 11, which means sun is within the 30 days of the fall equinox and therefore part of the Sharad season. So somebody can actually go as far as 4800 BCE and you can find lunar month of Kartik aligning with the Sharad season. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at the other extreme. Kartika at the end of Sharad season. Very recent times, guys. 300 CEs. Only 1700 years ago. Okay. Uh, around the time of the Council of Na Naesia. You know? Okay. When finally Bible was written, a full moon of Kartik, full moon of Kritika, Kartika between Barani and Rohini. So that's Kartika full moon. And if you look at the opposite position, sun, and if you look at the uh, right ascension, remember, 12 plus minus 2. So between 10 and 14. And this is before 14 hours, which means the position of sun is within plus minus 30 degrees of autumnal equinox. And therefore, this full moon of Kartik is the full moon happening within the Sharad season and at the end of Sharad season, but still within Sharad season. So if we combine this, look at the faulty claim of Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar saying only lunar month of Kartik would align with Sharad only during that thousand years. Or look at the other faulty claim of Professor Achar, claiming that lunar month of Kartik will align with Sharad season only during those 1400 years. We can plot this. Against that, the truth, the reality, astronomy 101 tells us that the lunar month of Kartik as far as the recent time period is concerned, would have aligned with the Sharad season for about 5,000 plus years. And look at that time period. What I showed you there is what? Um, 4,800 BCE through 300 CE. What a difference. And these two gentlemen are using their faulty arguments to say why a Mahabharata date is not possible any side, anywhere outside these two bounds. But the funny thing is yet to come. This is itself is very faulty and funny, but the actual reference based on which these guys are spending and spending their time and wasting other people's time, such as actually this episode. Of course, Vade Vade Jayate Tattva Bodo. So hopefully this becomes enlightening for many 
individuals, Mahabharata enthusiasts, Mahabharata researchers to understand the mistakes made by the past, okay, past researchers. The actual reference Udyog 81.7, which says Sharadante Himagame, which is to say, assuming they take Kartik, Kaumude as a Kartik, and let's give them a benefit of doubt just for a minute. That full moon of Kartik or lunar month of Kartik aligning with the end of Sharad season, Sharadante Himagame, do you know when is happening? It's happening somewhere here, which is what? Let's take this as like from 500 BCE to about 500 CE. So anyone taking this verse literally, dogmatically, and foolishly trying to use these words to explain, collaborate, corroborate, justify their date, what a disaster it is, because they are not understanding it, but essentially they are saying the Mahabharata war happened sometime after 500 BCE uh, or around 500 CE. And our Nityananda Mishraji went even further using another faulty reference, which had nothing to do with the timing of Mahabharata war, that he said Mahabharata war actually happened sometime after 500 CE. Now, he's not saying it in his words, but that's what he's claiming. And the humorous part is he's not even aware of what he is claiming. This is not to pick only Nityananda Mishraji or Dr. Ashok Bhatnagar or late Professor Narari Achar. This is a mainstream thinking, extremely careless, extremely casual, extremely faulty, with a zero knowledge at least based on what they claim, what they state, the logic they use, the justifications they use of astronomy. This is how sad and pathetic the situation is when it comes to the dating research of Indian Itihasa. Be it Mahabharata dating, be it Ramayan dating, be it Rugveda dating, be it dating of Bhagavad Puran, be it dating of um, Vishnu Puran, or many other historical events. Okay, so this is another disaster, by the way, guys. Okay, what do we have? And I think I said this, so, so I won't repeat, but when uh, I did give a response, uh, you know, albeit indirect, because I didn't want to waste my time, uh, but when Girish Naik uh, ji asked the question, I did respond. And actually, there are many that I can respond and I will or I may respond in the future. Uh, when this was brought to the attention of Nityanda Mishraji, who initially claimed that he is confident I will not respond, but he would be very happy if I respond. <laughs> when I did respond and somebody brought it to his attention, I forgot the individual's name, but I do have it somewhere. So this is written by that individual to Nityananda Mishraji. Sir, Nilesh Okji has given some clarification on his analysis and objection raised by scholars like you in this video. And he gave the link. This is Nityanandaji's response. He said, I don't need to see it. Go and read Nyaya Darshana, okay? Uh, especially the chapter on uh, points of defeat, okay? Nigrahastana. Okay, this is this is a classic case of uh, a pratiba because he doesn't have a good response. It's a classic case of silence. Uh, okay, that is also a point of defeat. It is a classic case of vikshep. You know, now how is this different? Well, it is not different than when Galileo was pointing his telescope towards the sky, and he saw four moons of Jupiter, or the celestial body as imperfect as the earth and he wanted to show this to the church authorities guess what not only the church authorities tortured him but when galileo offered them to show these celestial bodies through his telescopes they refused to see it why well only they know but we can take an easy guess you see a deja vu moment here when Nityananda Mishraji writes, I don't need to see it. All right, let's close. Now, what could be the reasons for such mediocrity? 
And again, I don't mean these three individuals that we are discussing in this video. This is actually epidemic, guys. This is how serious this issue is. Not many people want to talk about it. Many wants to be simply goody-goody when they run into each other in the conferences. And frankly, it has become a mutual admiration club to an extent because of the mediocrity on multiple individuals' parts. So, you know, it's like, uh, what, what do you call the is uh, hama me sab nange hai? You know, that is the problem. Now, what could be the reason? I mean, it's one to just complain about it, but can we find a way out of it? I cannot claim that I know a very easy or sure short way to solve this problem. But at least if we if we can analyze why this might be happening. And based on my 30 years of research experience and last 15 years of interactions with various uh, Indic researchers, both anti-Indic researcher, anti-India Indic researchers, but also with pro-Indic researchers, I can say that these are some of the reasons, frankly. Many scientists don't understand science. I mean, you know, they may have degrees, bachelor's, master's, PhD. They may be in academia. They may be in a pure research. And, you know, frankly, they may be good at some of the things they do. That is not to say that everything they do is wrong, but many scientists, they, even when they do the science, like, you know, in a repetitive fashion, they truly don't understand the scientific method. Scientific, they don't have scientific acumen. They don't have a Vidyana Buddhi, at least not the evolved sense of it. Many scientists don't understand Dharmic text. Now, <laughs> we have a problem on the other side. Many Dharmics don't understand Dharmic text believe it or not, and many dharmics don't understand science. Now, frankly, you can take these uh, combinations and replace these words scientist and dharmics with non-scientist, non-dharmics, adharmics. Adharmic is a word we use. Anti-scientists, like people who are against science in some ways, non-scientists, and all of these permutations and combinations still apply and they exist. Now, as I said, I don't have a quick solution but to recognize the problem is the first step in finding the solution. In my small ways, this is what I have done. Okay, I researched for 30 years. I published my first book in 2011. And since then I have published a total of three books, many more books in the pipeline as, the time, as time permits. A few researchers, actually a good number of researchers, slowly but surely are joining this jnana yadnya, tattva jnana, tattva bodha yadnya. Uh, one of the good examples of that would be this uh, Yuganta by Young Jeevan Rao. A phenomenal book. I would encourage everyone to pick that copy. Uh, definitely plus my three books. If you are in India, they are available through Subhu Publications. If you are outside India anywhere, and if you have access to Amazon, you can have these three books of mine and Yuganta by Jeevan Rao through Amazon. And some of the translations, some of the, well, some translations exist of my books. For example, when did the Mahabharata War happen in Kannada? The historic Rama in Marathi, abridged translation of the historic Rama in Hindi, and many more translations in multiple languages of India and some foreign languages are in works. I do not know when they will be ready, when they will come out. So please do not ask me when a specific translation is going to be available. I know as much as you do. When it does come out, I will mention it somewhere in one of such videos, in my lectures, in my live programs and so on. Thank you very much. It's one hour, four minutes. Uh, please, Take time to watch this video multiple times if required. Give your succinct comments. That tells me what subjects to cover. What are some of the challenges you are facing as you try to understand uh, the various viewpoints, various uh, research papers, various books. All right. And I'll see you shortly in another episode. Namaskar.